Just last month, there was a follow-up conference in Marrakesh, Morocco. This was COP22. The, what is it of the parties? Conference of the parties. Conference of the parties. Um, Paris was COP21. This was COP22. Were you both there? Or, you yes, know, we were. In Marrakesh? Um, I, I didn't see a whole lot of coverage about this, certainly not to the level of, of Paris. What went on with this uh, follow-on conference? Uh, so this was supposed to be all details, nothing exciting. It was supposed to be what's the transparency mechanism going to look like? How do you think about finance? How do you think about all these different details, loss and damage, da, 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 down the line? Um, the notable event that occurred during this conference of the parties was the US presidential election, which happened on the second day of the conference of a two week long conference. So in some ways, what was going to be a very humdrum occurrence was exciting for, for a few different reasons. First of all, the treaty had gone into force way earlier than people had expected, November 4th. And second, there was immediately a lot of question of would this be a repeat of the Kyoto Protocol, which the US never ratified, and the US failure to ratify the Kyoto Protocol was viewed as a big dent on the, its effectiveness and the effectiveness of global climate action. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, the question on the ground in Marrakesh was, is this Kyoto all over again? But I think in some ways what was inspiring, or at least uh, a point that people could come together around is the fact that the, U the world as a whole is so much different than it was in the late 1990s with the Kyoto Protocol. There's unambiguous understanding that climate change is real. And in many ways, that long-term temperature goal that Chris mentioned, keeping warming well below 2 degrees Celsius, pursuing efforts towards 1.5, is there and that ambitious because of the recognition that impacts are already happening, and 1.5 represents a level of dangerous climate change. A second way that the world is different that I think was something people came around is that solutions are increasingly feasible. We see parts of the world where solar and wind are becoming competitive with fossil-based energy sources. We see this hope and aspiration that we're almost on the brink of clean energy being the good stuff, it really entering into an era of climate responses. And then the third thing that I think people recognize was that there's so much more momentum on the climate issue. Back in the late 1990s, the US was the world's largest emitter. At this point, China, on an annual basis, has twice the emissions of the US, even though the US is still the largest historical cumulative emitter. Uh -huh. And that meant that everyone, in some ways, looked over at China to see what might happen. And the early indications were promising, with countries around the world emphasizing that this is a treaty that's meant to last and that there's determination to carry it forward. All right. Did you want to add anything to that? You were there. We, we arrived in Marrakesh the <laughs> day after the election in the US. And the atmosphere we expected was uh, one of dejection and being morose. Instead, there were, really, there were really two themes that were dominant, even within w one, one day of the US election. The first was countries everywhere said, well, you know, we, we deal with um, setbacks all the time. We deal with unfriendly governments all the time. We, we'll find a way to deal with this situation. And the other move that was really dominant within hours of the results of the US election being announced was this sense that, well, this is an agenda that the world is going to carry on. We would love to have the US in a leadership position. If the US is in a lagging position, we're still going to carry this agenda mm -hmm. forward. And within hours, that was the dominant mood across this meeting. And it didn't really flag the whole two weeks. Interesting. The FBI's argument is Congress is still considering it. We need this as a temporary measure before Congress passes the law we need. Right? And so in this case, the judge wins because that's the judge. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> But it does become a, a legal question, not just a procedural question, yeah. in terms of Congress thinking about but not taking up some of this. There's also more than semantic questions around what is a backdoor. Uh, 
I've gone round and round on this uh, with friends and colleagues, and so you get into a real question of what is or is not a backdoor and what is defined. It kind of doesn't matter in some ways. It comes back to the same end result in the end. Um, so I, I think functionally, we have ourselves a problem. And just to point out, you know, we've been talking about particularized individual suspicion through a court process that you have. Uh, you know, a court ordering a particular phone, a DA involved, there's no reason why it has to stay that way either, right? So as an example um, of an alternative, uh, Cisco makes routers. They make the stuff that makes the internet go. They are the, the guts of the internet. Um, they've managed to ship a backdoor to a backdoor to their routers that they had signed. They didn't mean to. Huh. Um, there's some questions as to, you know, it didn't appear to be the same groups that created the first and the second backdoor, right? Um, but that's the sort of thing that could come from a court. It might not be an open court. It might not be a US court. And companies could be ordered to not just do one phone at a time, one by one by one by thousands. They could be ordered to do the update to all phones that get the update. And so that's also the concern. This is very broad reaching. It's not just phones. It's your TV. It, and it's also not just, you know, let's make it easier to, to break into your phone when we have the physical device. It's let's remotely be able to turn the camera on. Let's be able to record everything that you say. Right. Right. So this is amazingly far reaching in implications as to where it goes. And the FBI is doing one small nibble. Um, but the path this takes, if companies can be compelled to say, yes, I say this software is good. I've signed it to something that is being ordered by a government, maybe not our own, is really pretty bad. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, I don't know how much worse it gets with, with tech. It's really yeah, pretty I, bad. I can hear you struggling to say how bad it is. It's, like, it's just really bad. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's get our audience in this. Uh, the way this works is just raise your hand and wait for Crystal to arrive with the microphone so that people who watch this video later on will actually get to hear your question. Um, and if you have a comment, how, how you feel about it, rather than just a question, uh, that's, that's fine, too. So we've got our first one here. And if you will also stand up, and that makes it a lot easier on our camera people. Hi, my name's Celso. Uh, I'd like to play devil's advocate just for a moment. Sure. Um, uh, Apple presumably treats its signing mechanism as its crown jewels. It's an, a very essential secret that only it can uh, manage. If it gets out in the wild, you know, the game's over. Yeah. Um, why couldn't they use the same security procedures that they use for their signing mechanism to develop and hold that special cracking software such that it would never get out in the wild, would never get in the hands of the FBI. So people argue that that's something that conceivably Apple could do without, you know, causing this, uh, you know, huge privacy and security problem. Fair enough. It, it sounds like the locked room question again. But it, it is the locked room question again. So let's assume that you can, in fact, keep things locked in a room, which is more than the US government can do, <laughs> right? Um, you have to keep it locked in a room against physical attack, against bribery, um, against all sorts of social attacks. Um, so far, uh, we have yet to find an organization that's managed to be robust in all of the different directions that you need to be robust in any permanent way. right? And I, I think that when you have the US government failing to protect their own assets, it's hard to imagine placing that burden on a private company and saying, but we think you can do that. But doesn't Apple already have that with its signing capability? Apple's been very quiet about what they do around their signing. So I'm not able to answer that. I don't know, for example, if you're designing that, you might imagine something like no one person has all of that key. So now you have a couple of people. Well, what if one of those people gets hit by a bus? So now you've got backups, basically, under studies, right? And so now you've got you know 10 people, each of whom has a small fragment. I don't know how they do it. Um, 
but that's the sort of system that you'd have to develop. Uh, I think the question is more what happens when governments have the ability to force this to be compelled and less the tech issue. And what criminal investigations are they ignoring? Sure. So, so I was involved in counterterrorism investigations before 9-11. And, and I think during that time period, the FBI, in their criminal justice work, uh, focused on terrorism appropriately. They, they, uh, when I was sent undercover against neo-Nazi organizations, I wasn't infiltrating the neo-Nazi movement. I wasn't uh, uh, targeting people because of things they said. Rather, we were conducting criminal investigations focused on people who were actually violating the law. So we had uh, weapons trafficking. We had actual conspiracies to, to engage in violent acts. And, and the, those investigations were successful because we kept them tightly focused on the individuals who were doing harm. And what I learned from that work was that the, the way a terrorist group operates, the, the ideological component of a group was, was separate from the violent group, right? If, if you saw somebody who was actively speaking out on neo-Nazi issues and writing newsletters and, and uh, publishing reports, that was probably because that person felt that was an effective way of getting their viewpoint across. Uh, uh -huh. And the people who were engaged in violent disagreed with that and felt that no violence was necessary. So there was a natural division between those two entities. But after 9-11, the government and the FBI in particular uh, put people in charge who didn't know very much about terrorism. And they went to a mass surveillance approach. And that was the Patriot Act and the, the amendments to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that enabled this, the, the Cold War surveillance machine we built to, to protect us against the Soviet Union was now being turned inward against the American public. And at the same time, you had focused surveillance, particularly of Muslim communities. And this was widespread, focusing on mosques, focusing on, on uh, Muslim religious organizations and Muslim civic organizations. Um, and, and one of the most damaging was the FBI started a program that was originally uh, well-intended to, to reach out to identify all, all the mosques and, and Muslim religious centers in every FBI field office territory to approach them and say, we know there are post 9-11 anti-Muslim acts. If you are, are victimized, please call us because it's our job to, to investigate hate crimes. So it started for a good reason but, but the documents we obtained through FOIA showed that it morphed very quickly into a program where they were actually using this community outreach, which was supposed to be building trust with Muslim communities to instead gather intelligence about those communities, about the organizations that participated in these programs. And, and so would, that, would you I'd, um, characterize these as kind of uh, fishing expeditions as the old adage? Uh, it, it, I mean, even worse than fishing expeditions, because it was really more about intelligence gathering. So they weren't interested in, in gathering, you know, fishing for evidence of a crime, but rather just gathering generalized information about the community. And, and some of the documents we found from the perspective of a former FBI agent were, were astonishing, you know, about where in a mosque the women pray, about... Um, uh, you know, a, a person talking about where their daughter was studying abroad, you know, these sorts of things that really had no business being in an FBI intelligence file, and yet we obtained them from the FBI, so clearly they were. They were in the files and they were searchable. Um.